become a man of success, but rather try to become a man of value. A very pleasant morning to one and all. I am Mahalakshmi from the Department of Physics. We are delighted to welcome you all to the virtual conference on future materials and its applications. A day without prayer is a day without blessing, and a life without prayer is a life without power. So let us begin the auspicious day by singing the blessings of Almighty with a prayer song. Thank you all. We feel blessed indeed. The topic of the today's session are hybrid microwave sintering of ceramics for electrical applications. However, difficult life may seem, there is always something you can do and succeed at. Your positive action combined with the positive thinking results in success. Success is not final, failure is not fatal. It is courage to continue that counts. With this positive note, let us begin our today's session. Now, I invite Ms. V. K. Najiha Suman from the Department of Chemistry to deliver the welcome address. Blessing of grace and peace be with you today and every day. Very good morning to one and all present here. On this auspicious occasion, I would like to welcome you all for the national level conference on Department of Physics and Chemistry. First and foremost, I welcome our management and our trustees in absentia. I welcome you, sir. Now, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome the one who gives direction to every students and faculties in our college. She is none other than our principal, Dr. M. Imbavali, ma'am. I welcome you, ma'am. With great honor and pleasure, I would like to welcome our PRO, Ms. B. Saktimala, ma'am. I welcome you, ma'am. It is a cheerful mind that is persevering. It is a strong mind that hews its way through a thousand difficulties. I extend my joy of heart by welcoming our HOD ma'am, Dr. N. Charumati, Head Department of Chemistry. 
and Dr. V. Sabari and Dr. C. Pavitra Ma'am, Head Department of Physics, who has been the pillar behind this event. I welcome you, ma'am. Stars shine at night. Some stars shine at bright daylight. Today, we have Dr. Madhuri Ma'am, Associate Professor, Center for Functional Materials, VIT University, Velur, and Dr. Akila Siva Ramakrishnan Sir, Associate Professor, Department of Chemistry, VIT University, and Dr. D. Zarina Ma'am, Assistant Professor, Department of Physics, Jawaharlal Nehru Technological University, Andhra Pradesh. It is an honor for me to welcome you, sir and ma'am, on behalf of our college. It is a pleasure for all of us to have such a great personalities among us. We all are keen to hear from you, sir and ma'am, about your journey, knowledge and success mantras. Thank you for taking out time for all of us from your busy schedule to share your thoughts with us. Once again, I welcome you, sir and ma'am. Now I welcome all our HODs, faculties, research scholars and students for this wonderful session to enrich our knowledge. I welcome you all for this wonderful session. Last but not least, I wholeheartedly welcome all the participants for glorifying this event. Once again, welcome you all. Thank you for giving this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Najiha. Felicitation is inspiration to others and motivation to whom you are felicitating. Now I invite our beloved principal ma'am, Dr. M. Inbavalli ma'am, to felicitate the gathering. Thank you, ma'am. Most respected secretary and trustees in absentia, most respected and eminent professors, resource persons of today's two days national level virtual conference on future materials and its applications, Madam PRO, heads of the department, uh, uh, participants, professors, and uh, students, research scholars, and all other participants, staffs, and dear students, happy morning to all of you. Conference presentation would disseminate the research findings to the participants and the colleagues. It helps us to have a up-to-date uh, knowledge and new uh, research findings and innovations. With the advent of inter uh, internet and the various technologies, research findings of, uh, of recent days is very much in the emerging. And also it helps us to meet the demanding industrial and employers perspectives and expectations too. So being either the researcher or uh, faculty or the students, whatever the knowledge we are gaining, this has to be transformed into the research findings to upgrade and update ourselves in the recent technologies. This definitely will help us for the advancement of our career. So with this wonderful platform, we have our three eminent resource persons and professors from various universities, VIT, Vello, and Jawaharlal Nehru Technical University, Andhra Pradesh. Thank you all professors for your uh, acceptance of our invitation and uh, presence here. Thank you, ma'am, and thank you, sir. On behalf of our institution, we once again welcome you and thank you for your uh, presence today and sharing of your valuable knowledge and experience to all the participants, which definitely would help them to upgrade their knowledge. And my best wishes to the 
convener of this two days nation level virtual conference dr sabari and dr pavitra from department head department of physics and dr charumathi head department of chemistry for uh, your great initiatives and bringing the eminent professors to this wonderful platform and also my best wishes to the students who take an effort in hosting and organizing this two days nation level conference and my best wishes to all the participants for your effort in participating in the conference and also interest in learning new technologies for your life skills so have a, gr a great day use the opportunity thank you all for your presence thank you ma'am to be inspired is great but to be an inspiration is a honor now i invite ms r shalini from the department of chemistry to introduce today's resource person A pleasure morning to all. It gives me an immense pleasure to introduce the chief guest of today's session, Dr. W. Madhuri Ma'am, Associate Professor, Center of Functional Material, School of Advanced Science, VIT Vello. Dr. W. Madhuri Ma'am did her BSc Physics in 1995, MSc Physics in 1998, and PhD in Physics in the year 2008 in Sri Krishna Devaraya University, Anantapur. And it's very interesting, yes, her area of specialization is solid state physics, a yeah, very wide and specialized topic and her research interests are electroceramics, multiferroics, magnetocalorics, ferrite polymer composites, microwave synthesis and absorption properties. I am glad to say Dr. W. Madhuri Ma'am has more than 19 years of teaching experience and her teaching interest of condensed matter physics, material science, new generation energy, and core course in physics for undergraduate and postgraduate students. Dr. Madhuri, Madhuri Ma'am worked as lecturer at Aurora Degree College, Chittapalli during 2001. Ma'am worked as an assistant professor of TRR Engineering College, Patancharu, Indore Meda from 2001 to 2009 together to that working as an assistant professor of physics in the school of advanced science vit university Bello, since 2009 to till date dr Bhag madhuri ma'am has published more than 80 articles in national and international journals ma'am has done a very great achievements in science which we cannot explain in few words. We are very pleased to have you, ma'am, an eminent researcher among us to share the knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Shali. Ma'am, now you are the host and you may start your presentation. Yes, am I audible? Good morning, all of you. Uh, can anyone please respond? If I am there, am I audible? Yes, I am audible. Thank you. Thank you. I'll try to share first. Uh, let us see the share, uh, whether I can share the screen. Then, 
I will start. Uh, I believe you must be seeing my PPT. Yes, may I know if uh, the slides are seen? Is my screen being shared? Yes, ma'am. Right, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, may I know your name? Who is actually comparing on this? Mahalakshmi, ma'am. Mahalakshmi. Thank you. Thank you. Now, at the outset, I would like to thank the management of... Uh, Marga Kesar Jain College for Women to actually, and I would also like to congratulate them to take up such a measure uh, for UG and PG students and the PhD students in their college uh, to have a virtual seminar. And during this uh, pandemic time, though uh, people could not gather, they have taken a very nice step and uh, have come up with a good a conference on uh, future materials and its applications. So I'd like to congratulate all the management uh, people involved, the conveners, co-conveners, organizers, everybody. And my uh, thanks to uh, principal, uh, Dr. Uh, Imbavalli, and uh, the other HODs who have uh, contacted me to for the lecture today. So Thank you uh, to the HODs, Dr. Sebari, Dr. Charumati, and Dr. Pavitra. Yes, of course, Pavitra is uh, my student, and usually there won't be uh, any necessities or mm -hmm. formalities between both of us. So, yeah, but still here on the platform, I would like to actually congratulate her to uh, take up such a uh, big event and doing it online, you know, doing it uh, offline is different because we are all used to doing it offline and uh, you have a lot of support there and you know what to do. Every one of us know what to do. But here, when it comes to a virtual platform or an internet platform, you definitely need a very strong technical team which should be supporting you all the time. Uh, so, yeah, and I would like to uh, really uh, congratulate all the supporting team who is behind this uh, virtual conference. And with this uh, note of thanks, I'd like to start the seminar. I don't know, you also see these small uh, uh, windows on the screen. Yeah. Can this be moved aside? Yeah, at least. Yes. Okay, fine. If it doesn't go out of the screen, yeah, we can move it. So, and uh, my special thanks to Miss Shalini, I believe, who has introduced me very nicely. Thank you. Thanks for my introduction. So today I thought of uh, introducing all of you to a technique called microwave sintering, which is used to prepare ceramics. And we can use this ceramics for many applications, but here I'll be mostly touching on the ceramics, which are mostly used for electrical applications. So the topic would be hybrid microwave sintering of ceramics for electrical applications. Okay, I will uh, skip that because Shalini has really given a nice uh, introduction of me. But here is uh, a small uh, video on uh, VIT. Is the audio being shared? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yes, thank you.
So that is where I work and VAT has its own uh, glory. I wish you all should come once when we actually physically uh, conduct a conference. We are also conducting a conference uh, maybe coming uh, February or March. So I would uh, definitely uh, float the flyer once we uh, ready. We are ready with the dates and all. So I expect most of you uh, kids here for the conference. Fine. So coming to today's topic, and I would also like to uh, Mahalakshmi, please uh, inform me if I'm going beyond my time. Okay. Please uh, let me know uh, five to ten minutes before. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mahalakshmi. So today we will see what's the what are ceramics, what are materials basically, and, and then what are ceramics and the special class of ceramics which are uh, the, called as electro ceramics, are ferrites and ferroelectrics and their synthesis and sintering techniques, and then how a special synthesis when you change your synthesis, how the morphology, the structure can be changed for the material, and then how these materials can be utilized in various applications. Okay, so let us go ahead. So you see materials can basically be classified into metals, ceramics and polymers. See, you all might have studied what is this new classification we never heard. We all studied metals, insulators and semiconductors. Now, what is this? See, you can actually go take ceramics as insulators and semiconductors together. Few ceramics are highly insulating in nature, few of them are semiconducting in nature, fine? So ceramics would actually include both of them. And polymers, you know, so polymers are the materials which wherein the molecular chain actually goes on uh, building or getting linked to each other and builds into a very large molecule, you know, into a very large entity. And you call such uh, materials as polymers. Now, a combination of polymer and a metal or polymer and a ceramic or ceramic and a polymer or ceramic metal metal, or any of the combinations, two or more combinations of these three, we call them as composite. We call them as composites. Composites are materials of different uh, kinds, materials which are of different nature, of different virtue. They have a different nature, they have a different electronic structure, they have different uh, thermal, electrical and optical properties uh, externally. But when you try to mix them up, such different, entirely different materials, when you try to mix them up, what are you expecting out of it? And such you will mix them because you are expecting some uh, application out of it, which is advantageous to us, which is very useful for the mankind. So such materials, when you mix up the entirely different materials and put them into one, you call such materials as composites. So today I will not take much uh, time in the basics. I will straight uh, push into the required things because our topic is electro ceramics. So let us see what are ceramics. Ceramics are mostly, mostly ceramics are non-metals and are compound materials. Always they are compound materials. You don't have any mental ceramics. And there are no, again classified as oxides as well as non-oxide materials. So oxide materials come under these categories. Oxide ceramics can again be classified into ferrites, ferroelectrics, ferroelastics, fine. Whereas non-oxide ceramics would be like carbides, nitrides, borates, silicates, wherever you have the metal carbides or metal uh, nitrides, metal uh, borates or silicates, you call them as non-oxide ceramics, but these are also ceramics. They, are, they also have a wide range of applications. But our uh, interest is here today, so we will see this part. So let us first come to the ferrets. I'll not get deep into your uh, classification of magnetism and what are ferrites and all. 
I will today speak about fair rights for the application point of view in the point of view of an industry, how an industry look at a fair right. Okay. So a fair right is basically a very magnetic material, which is or also no, can be classified as metal oxide ceramics that are magnetic semiconductors. Most of them are semiconducting. At times, they are also highly insulating depending on their constituent elements. Right? And in ferrites, you can see the spin arrangement of the sub lattices. See, you have metal oxide. In ferrites, it's usually the best example for ferrite is magnetite, which is iron ferrite, or you can call it as ferrous ferrite. Fine. So it is Fe, Fe2O4. So the first Fe is in the two plus state, whereas the second Fe is in the three plus state. And of course, you have uh, O4, oxygen, who has, which will balance the uh, metallic ions in the compound. Fine. Now, you have this metal oxygen bonds, which will be bonding between the A uh, site and fine, which would be actually. Uh, uh, having a bond between the two plus uh, uh, iron and three plus iron, both will be bonding to oxygens, and these two will actually form two different lattices. As they form two different lattices, they interlock into one another, and the structure is usually the basic ferrets will have a spinal structure. We will anyway see that later. Fine. So it would be an interlocking of the system, and you have to actually. Uh, see that one of the system or one of the lattice will have a, a stronger, uh, higher uh, moment, whereas the other one will have a moment which is weaker than the other one and is in the opposite direction. So, however, because this is little weaker and is in the opposite direction, you will always have a net magnetic moment. And this kind of alignment in ferrites of these uh, domains or of these spins, various domains, in each domain, the spin is being uh, oriented in a particular direction and all the spins of that particular domain will be oriented in that particular system. And you have to, uh, you will call that uh, particular uh, orientation of the moment in the domains as spontaneous polarization. You call them as spontaneous polarization, fine? Now, so I'm again going back to basics, so I don't, which I don't want. So here magnetization, basic man, I don't know whether you are able to see this top line here, because I don't know how to move this. Bar, okay, maybe I think I can pull this bar down now. Okay. And yeah. Is it okay now? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. So the origin of magnetism, magnetization can be basically a macroscopic origin or a microscope. Macroscopic is outwardly the uh, external currents, what we actually have, you know, the external currents of the, uh, which we apply. See, if you have a current loop and the current is flowing like this in the loop, then we know our right hand thumb rule according to if you are, Fingers, if, you're, if the direction of the current is in the direction of the, uh, the in the direction the, how you fold your right fingers, then the magnetic moment will be in a direction your thumb is directing. So this is what is it. And the moment, the magnitude of this moment would be the product of the current which is flowing in the loop in and the area of the loop. So you, all, all of you know this. This is what is a macroscopic picture or outwardly how magnetism is originated. But what is the microscopic picture or in a singular atom, how does the uh, 
magnetism originate. So in an atom or an atomic current uh, origination of magnetism can happen because of three things. See, one is orbital motion of electrons. You just think of this, orbital motion of electron is nothing but electron is moving in the similar way just we have seen here there, like the current is, motion of electrons is nothing but current, movement of electron or flow of charge is nothing but current. So this current will be moving. And if you assume a isolated uh, hydrogen atom, of course, there is no such uh, thing, but just for the imagination and just to conceive the idea, if you assume a uh, isolated, uh, one second, I'll just mute this. I'm sorry, I'm just, uh, Srimati. Yeah, I'm sorry for that. And anyway, I have muted it now. Yeah. So when you uh, consider an orbital motion of an electron, it is the motion of a charged particle in a circular orbit. Now, when the charge is moving in a circular orbit, in the similar way, you have a magnetic moment in an atom also. Understood? Now, it is not the electron that is actually revolving around the uh, nucleus alone. We know that the electrons actually rotate around themselves or revolve around themselves and have a spin. And in most cases, apart from your hydrogen atom, in most of the other cases, you have electrons which are of opposite spin in the same orbital. And the spins usually, the magnetic moment that is developed due to the spin of electron, see, when it is spinning around itself, what happens? The area of the spinning, the loop, the area of the spin is very, very, very small compared to the area of the orbit, you know, compared to the area of the orbit, the spinning orbit or the spinning uh, loop is very, very small. And hence, the moment you develop due to spin of electron is very, very small. Similarly, the spin of nucleus is also very small because it's heavier and cannot actually have a higher spin. Spin of nucleus is mostly uh, useful only when you are in the, uh, what do you call, very low temperatures spin of nucleus can be considered, but uh, because at very low temperatures, what happens is most of the electrons do not actually have a proper movement. They, their motion becomes very slow. And hence that time, the moment of uh, electron, the moment that is uh, generated due to the motion of electrons is almost equivalent to the moment of the uh, magnetism that is being generated due to the spin of a nucleus also. See, you can see usually the magnetic moment that is generated due to the orbital motion of electrons is approximately of the order of 10 raised to minus 24 ampere meter square. 10 raised to minus 24. But when you try to do the, the, the same thing for a, a nucleus or a single proton nucleus also like hydrogen, then the point is it is approximately 10 raised to minus 27 you will get because you see here the moment is eh upon 4 pi m where m is the mass of the electron e is the charge of the electron h is Planck's constant so when the mass of the electron is in the denominator and you know the mass of a proton is higher than that of electron and which if it is in the denominator then automatically the moment decreases as your denominator increases, your moment decreases, fine. So there is almost a thousand uh, order of uh, magnitude, less magnetic moment is being generated by the spin of nucleus, whereas spin of electrons in most cases due to the Pauli exclusion principle, an unavoidable Pauli exclusion principle, the net moment will actually get canceled unless until you have a uh, singular electrons in a orbit, fine. So 
that is also very, very small. And even then it is very small because the area of spinning would be very, very small. That is why this is this would be highly negligible in most cases. Fine. Now, how is this magnetism can be realized into a bigger device, into a better these things, you know? See, for that, you need to first know the fundamental origin of uh, uh, the moment. And then you have to see how the moment in a particular atom or in a taken component, actually, the magnetic moment is originated and how the various molecules of the, the same atom interact or the same uh, material interact among themselves and that would give you the, if you know the interaction of the magnetic, magnetic interaction of the molecules, you will know the magnetism of the solids. Once you know the magnetism of a solid, uh, then you can actually estimate what should be your output and how you want to actually utilize it for your own applications. Fine. So, Here are a few applications of uh, ferrite materials. And I don't know whether this generation kids have seen this. Can anyone guess what is this? Hmm? These are called uh, tape recorder cassettes. And here is a tape on which uh, the audio is being uh, recorded. And even VCR cassettes also were similar, a little bigger in size. Uh, with a little wider tape than this tape, okay? And these tapes are magnetic tapes on which the audio is being recorded. And later has come your read-write heads like for CD and all, which actually utilizes the giant magneto resistance. You can also find applications of ferrites in uh, uh, high-frequency power applications, uh, then chokes or ballasts of your tube lights, fine. But however, people are uh, actually uh, coming out of these uh, things. And here is a frequency selective circuit, which is like tune uh, transformer. The transfer can, transformer can be tuned for the required frequency. Fine. And most of you might have seen this. What is this? This is a charger with a kind of a adopter kind of a thing here. Most of you think that this is an adopter, but it is not. It is actually a shield bead. That is when we are using your phone, mobile phone, your laptops, and a lot of other gadgets, your uh, things like whichever, like uh, trimmers, uh, what the people use for their sharing, uh, the hair dryers, vagera, vagera, what all we use, these are all gadgets. Uh, electronic uh, gadgets we are using, they actually emanate a lot of electromagnetic radiation out of it. And especially things like which, uh, like your uh, Bluetooth speakers and your uh, wireless uh, ear pods, you know, all these things are actually your remotes, your TV remote and all. All these things are actually picking up microwave signals and or uh, emanating the same signals, fine? And that is how your remote actually works, is it not? How does the remote work for a, a, a television or uh, your, uh, nowadays you have remote for everything. You have Alexa, not even remote. People, the general uh, science has grown uh, to a greater extent that you need not have a remote in your hand and uh, do the, go on pressing the keys, you know, not required. You can actually use a, uh, use Alexa and give instructions to Alexa. And uh, I have recently, Alexa can also speak many languages and can also have a male voice, you know? So, yeah. Uh, but this, uh, the, all these gadgets actually emit a lot of electromagnetic radiation. And that is not so good for the, uh, surroundings or for human uh, humans and especially for small creatures like birds and other things birds actually this uh, this uh, sparrow there was there used to be a very small sparrow of this kind uh, this size when we were uh, young but nowadays we don't see that sparrow but a modified 
or uh, robust sparrow of this size we are seeing, you know. So this is a, a evolutional change or it was the struggle for those sparrows to exist. It was the struggle for the sparrows to exist. And these beads, these beads are called shield beads, which actually shield or which actually absorb these electromagnetic radiations emitted by, by, by that particular device are around it. Any device which is around it, which is emanating electromagnetic radiation will be absorbed by these beads. Such beads are called as shield beads. Fine. And here are uh, the same, uh, what do you call, tape recorder uh, uh, recording uh, and read writing uh, heads, which is a circular toroidal uh, ring of uh, magnetic ring will be there on which you will have an inductor coils. And this gap would actually uh, initiate or would actually magnetize, demagnetize your magnetic tape. So in magnetizing and demagnetizing the tape, you will be actually recording or writing on the tape, the audio or the video, fine. But later on, the same thing is modified with a very thin slit so that you can actually uh, accommodate more data or make it more uh, 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 storage volume to increase the storage volume for the same set uh, amount of uh, magnetic tape such a, uh, Read write heads are being uh, invented. But we are now uh, about that. And this is a similar uh, pulse sensor uh, based on the giant magneto resistance, uh, this thing. And this is a humidity sensor again, again based on magnetic uh, this things. So the next this thing is ferroelectrics. Ferroelectrics are basically the analogs of your. Uh, ferromagnetic materials. So you all know what is a ferromagnetic material, which will be having domain structure, which will be showing a hysteresis loop. And this hysteresis uh, or the magnetization of the fer ferromagnetic materials depend on temperature according to Curie Weiss law and so on and so forth. So similarly, this there are electrical, uh, these are electrical materials, which also have domain structure which also has spontaneous polarization, which exhibit uh, spontaneous polarization. They also have hysteresis curves between applied electric field and polarization. In ferrimagnetic materials, it is applied magnetic field and magnetization M, but here it is applied electric field and polarization P. Right? So similar hysteresis loops can be seen. This is also temperature dependent. This also is again being uh, governed by Curie law. So likewise, it has a lot of similarities with that of ferromagnetic materials, but these are electric in nature. These are electric in nature. These are not magnetic in nature. So thereby, these are called as ferroelectrics. Now there are various categories of ferroelectrics, but today we will be uh, talking mostly on piezoelectrics or in general ferroelectrics. Now what is piezoelectricity? Piezoelectricity is actually giving a pressure along a direction. Now you can see that as uh, this is being pressured, there is a voltage which is being created, fine? So now when you are compressing it, you have a greater voltage and when you release it, the voltage decreases, fine? So as you, if you really want to see it on a uh, cube, you can see it like this, when you are actually giving a pressure along uh, horizontally or around your, uh, this direction, then there will be a polarization of charges happening in a perpendicular direction like this. So maybe I, 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 would, I should have drawn it like this, from this end to this end, because this is like this then it is always perpendicular. The charge is being uh, developed in a perpendicular direction. Fine. So that is what is piezoelectricity. And this was first being uh, identified or invented by uh, Curies. And, uh, you know, they have uh, identified this in a quartz crystal. Quartz crystal 
is actually, uh, I should say, after the invention of piezoelectricity in quartz crystal by Curies, the, it is so indispensable that even for today, any watch you take, a wall clock, a wrist watch, uh, apart from your digital watches these days, what you get, but anything which has a dial, you know, which has the two dials which move, let it be a wall clock, a big wall clock, or a wrist watch, or whatever. You need to have a quartz, a small quartz crystal is being put there. Why? See, we give only battery. We give it, we put a battery on uh, in our wall clock as well as in our wrist watch also. Uh, I believe most along with me, most of the people are not using wrist watches also these days because of the invent of the mobiles. But uh, yeah, the point is in a wrist watch or in a wall clock, we give only electrical energy. Is it not? We put a battery. Now, when you put a battery, how is your uh, clock hands moving? What, uh, what makes it move? The clock hands move and you see the uh, dial or you see the watch time there. Fine. Now, how is that happening? This quartz crystal, the same thing is being used. Now, when it is reversed, when you are actually giving a voltage, then it is getting compressed and released. It's continuously under vibration. And these vibrations of the crystal are being picked up as mechanical energy. And this energy is transferred to the dial, the two hands. The two hands move on the clock now. And this, what do you call these vibrations are controlled by the voltage you are applying. And that is what is called as electrostriction. Electrostriction is giving electricity and getting a striction or a pressure or a strain output. You are getting a strain output by applying an electric field. Whereas piezoelectricity, or recently I have come to know that it should be called as piezoelectricity. Piezoelectricity means piezo is pressure. When you give pressure, then the material gets polarized in a direction perpendicular to that. Now, this is what is piezoelectricity. You are giving pressure and getting electrical charges being separated. Now, this is what is piezoelectricity. The converse of this is giving, applying an electric field and getting a compressions and rarefactions or getting a vibration out of the crystal or a vibration out of a piezoelectric material is what is known as electrostriction. Fine. These two are converse. Uh, phenomena, and if a certain material exhibits piezoelectricity, then it would also uh, exhibit electrostriction and vice versa. Fine. It can be utilized on either way, on either sides of its uh, application path. And these are few applications of piezoelectrics, wherein uh, you can see here, this is a, a read write data. Uh, one, see. As I told you, we have a hysteresis loop or there is a hysteresis behavior between the electric field and the polarization. And you can see that this is a very soft loop with very less uh, coercivity. So what happens is whenever you shift your electric field, you know, usually we go with the AC field. Now in your AC field, your field goes up, takes a maxima, comes down to zero and then go to the negative part, you know. Okay, what is an AC electric field? The field goes up, it's a sinusoidal, assume a sinusoidal wave, then you see that the wave goes up to the uh, maximum value, closes, comes down to zero, and goes below your uh, 90 degrees, uh, sorry, below your zero line, goes to negative uh, maxima, and then comes back to zero, fine? So in this hysteresis, this yeah. thing, this positive part would actually represent the positive loop and the negative part would represent the negative loop. So in the process, what you're doing, you're magnetizing it, demagnetizing it. It goes to zero, no? And again, you are magnetizing it in on the other direction and demagnetizing. So if you are in, if you are applying an AC field, you are continuously with the frequency of the AC field, you are continuously, mag uh, sorry, uh, did I say magnetized? No, sorry, it gets polarized, fine. You're polarizing and depolarizing your uh, ferroelectric or your piezoelectric, fine? So when you're continuously polarizing, depolarizing, so when you polarize, 
you take the data point as one, when you depolarize your data point will be zero. And that's how in the binary uh, system, you can always store your energy use in on a piezoelectric materials. And these piezoelectrics, as I told you, are uh, very good um, uh, responders to the uh, acoustic waves. They actually can conduct a lot of acoustic waves and they will, what is an acoustic wave? A sound wave. Any sound wave is an acoustic wave, fine. So when uh, you can also use the same quartz crystal to produce a high uh, uh, ultrasounds, high frequency ultrasonics, ultrasounds can be produced using the same quartz crystal. So since these crystals or these ferroelectrics can actually conduct a good uh, quality or good uh, number of, of uh, sound waves. These are mostly used in sonars as delay lines or absorbers of sonars. Okay, it will detect whether there is any sonar. What is a sonar? Hmm? Yeah, it's a sound navigation and ranging system, which would which is mostly being used by our defense and. Uh, uh, naval people for actually detecting uh, a foreign element in our waters, okay? So always sound need a medium to traverse. And unlike your electromagnetic radiation or light, which can propagate in vacuum, sound cannot propagate in vacuum. Sound needs a medium, fine? So these uh, ferroelectric materials it can be used as Actuators, they will, uh, actuators are nothing but something which actually produce a sound or a noise or actuators. And they can also absorb the amount of uh, sound and keep quiet. You know, it will, it may actually conduct to the other end, but may not send it back on in the same direction. You know, the, that is what uh, these uh, sonar obstructors uh, uh, do or sonar detectors do. They detect and they actually they take the signal and go ahead, uh, take it towards the other direction, but will not send it back to the this thing. Such uh, sonar absorbers are being uh, made using uh, ferroelectrics or piezoelectric materials. And these are also very good, uh, you know, uh, there are a class of materials of ferroelectrics, which are pyroelectric in nature which actually change their, uh, what do you call, with temperature. Pyro is temperature, heat, fine. There will be, they get polarized or depolarized depending on the temperature. When you raise the temperature or decrease the temperature, they, they get polarized and depolarized. And that property is being tapped for actually uh, Use, uh, using them as temperature sensors or infrared tensor sensors, etc., infrared detectors and other things, fine? So these are a few applications. Now let us get into the ceramic processing, how you can actually make, synthesize these materials in a laboratory. Now, in order to make these materials in a laboratory, you need to know what you want to make. What ceramic you want to make, whether you want to go with a ferrite or a ferroelectric or uh, a combination of ferrite and ferroelectric or whatever it is, you need to know what your end product is first. So you need to know your end product. Once you know your end product, you will choose your starting materials, fine? It's similar to a kind of uh, baking, I should say, fine? You want a chocolate cake or some other uh, cookie or something. You once you decide what you what is your final product, you will start with your corresponding ingredients. You know. Similarly, you need to know what ceramic you want to make first. Once you know that, you will be choosing your starting materials. You have to choose them. You have to collect them of high quality uh, starting materials, and then mix them up in a proper proportion, required proportion. And once you do that, once you do take the powders and mix them up or grinding is being done, you will actually heat it to a certain extent. You will not completely cook it, no. Your final product has not yet come. You will just heat it for a certain time, a certain temperature and leave it. And then such partially heated materials 
are called as green bodies. They are called as green powder, green uh, ceramic or green body. It is called green body. Green body here is a technical term. It does not mean that that particular material will have a green color and uh, or all something like that. No, you know, something like in um, drama industry and all people say it's a green room. You know, the makeup room is usually called as green room. Similarly here, the material is called as a green body or a green uh, powders. Fine. Now this green powders are again being uh, grinded and uh, given a shape whatever shape you want, the cookie you want, you want it as a pellet, you want it as a ring, you want it as a cylinder, as a bar, as a biscuit, whatever is the shape you want, you will dye it. You will actually make that into that particular shape and then go for a final heating, which is called as sintering. The final heating is called sintering. The preheating is called as calcination. The preheating is called as calcination. Right. So now, why do you need to do this heating twice? Why can't we go heat it? Just pull this uh, dyeing part here, just dye it and go for calcination? No, that won't work out because that will not give you the perfect structure which is required, as well as the strength of the material will be very low. As it is, ceramics are very brittle in nature. You just... Uh, leave them from this height, it might actually break. The ceramics may break. They are very brittle in nature. Understand? However, you need to have a proper uh, bonding between the metal oxides and the required structure has to be there. Unless until you have a required structure, you cannot actually uh, uh, what do you call it? You cannot actually see the required uh, properties of the material or what is being expected out of it, fine? So that is why when you go for a preheating, what does this preheating is why it is being done and why it is very important. It is important because it actually initiates a partial reaction because you have taken individual oxides, assume uh, zinc ferrite or something, then what do you need? You need zinc oxide, you need ferric oxide. You will take them in a proper proportion. Now. Mix them up in a proportion, grind them so that you get fine particles. And during the grinding also, what happens? There is a lot of uh, physical contact between zinc oxide and ferric oxide. And they are being crushed together, grinded together. And you will get a mixed powder. When you get these mixed powders, then you take these mixed powders and heat them to a certain extent. Why? Because these are powders, there is no other chemical reagent you are putting in that so as to initiate any reaction between them. Because I still don't want my final product as zinc oxide and ferric oxide, but I want it as zinc ferrite. When I want it as a zinc ferrite, I need to initiate a reaction between zinc and uh, ferric oxide. So you need to actually see to that catalyzing the uh, reaction. You know, here, the best way is going for heating it to a certain extent, fine. So that actually facilitates to initiate the uh, partial reaction. If you, your initial compounds are having any uh, higher oxides or carbides or uh, nitrates or anything, any such unwanted uh, volatile materials can be evaporated at this stage. You don't need them, they will be evaporated. And after calcination, you get pure uh, materials which is required for your output. You will not have any impure element in your uh, compound after calcination, right? And further, there may be some gases which are there which will be releasing out of it. Uh, uh, assume that you are using some carbonates in your, uh, as your starting materials instead of oxides. If you are taking a carbonate, then when you're taking a carbonate, there will be, when you heat it, there will be a release of carbon dioxide or gas. And this carbon dioxide or gas, as it gets released, these gases, as they release from the material, they may actually create cracks because due to this thermal energy, the gas gets uh, heated up and should come out of the compacted material very fast. It, has, it will uh, come out very fast because of the thermal energy you're giving. 
temperature you are giving. So in the process, it may actually give a crack to your material, which is not desirable, which is not a good sign of your uh, ceramics, fine. So in order to avoid all that, you can go for a low temperature heating of your materials for a certain temperature for a certain time. That would actually give, uh, take away certain uh, mishappenings that may happen at the final sintering stage, fine. Like these, he, here you can read them, like uh, it will initiate the uh, reaction, facilitates decomposition and evaporation of carbonates, nitrates, higher oxides, and any gases which are there, they can get uh, ev uh, evaporated, and then uh, it can homogenize and control the shrinkage. It, can, it will also control the shrinkage percentage. As you heat up, the material may get shrunk, and this shrinkage can also be controlled when you go for a two-step heating process. Fine. Now, once you die and get, want to go for the required shape of your material, then you will sinter it at a higher temperature. Usually, the temperature difference between your calcination to final sintering temperature would be approximately 200 to 250 degrees centigrade or more than that. A minimum of 150 degrees centigrade Maintenance of 150 to 200 degrees centigrade is always advisable when you go for uh, this calcination step. Your calcination temperature should be minimum 200 degrees centigrade less than your final sintering temperature. And usually, mostly all these ceramics are being heated at temperatures around 1200 degrees to 1600 degrees even. Fine. So that is the uh, temperature where these materials has to be sintered and being formed. That much of an amount of temperature is required for the material to form in the required structure, fine? So final sintering would actually facilitate the compaction of the material, dense, it will give the density to the material and form the structure, fine? And this is all uh, due to the thermal, uh, energy we are giving. And sintering can be defined as a therm thermodynamic uh, irreversible uh, property or irreversible uh, this thing, which is being performed on a material. You cannot get back your zinc oxide and ferric oxide back once you sinter them or even calcinate them. After calcination also, you cannot get back your zinc oxide or ferric oxide. Once a heat treatment is being done, it's an irreversible process, fine? Similar to actually burning your cake, you know? Once you burn your cake, you cannot get back your floor back fine? in the similar way. Now, what are the various effects and uh, the results of sintering? You can see here, Sintering would actually control the particle size. It will be a particle size distribution. The particle shapes can be controlled by uh, choosing a, a sintering technique and the program you are following, the temperature you are taking, the amount of time you are keeping uh, at a particular temperature. It will also, uh, what do you call, uh, control the porosity in your uh, ceramics agglomerations and homogeneity of your chemical composition, pore size distribution, temperature gradients, gaseous atmosphere or pressure, all these things are the various uh, factors that actually are involved along with their sintering. So when you actually uh, moderate or uh, manipulate these characteristics, you will get different properties in your final ceramic. And all these things would actually result in the density of the ceramics and the grain growth of your ceramic. There are basically three kinds of sintering techniques. The first and foremost is the conventional sintering. Then is the microwave sintering or hybrid microwave sintering, which is uh, my uh, area of specialization. And the third is plasma, spark plasma sintering. And I'll just give you a short uh, uh, this thing on all these uh, materials or, or sorry, on all these uh, sintering techniques. Coming to conventional sintering, conventional sintering is simple, very simple, and is also equivalent to your regular hearth in a kitchen, a regular uh, oven in a kitchen, right? 
it will be usually having an external rods fine which are placed uh, it will be having a box kind of a thing or in the box on the sides or on the top you can have silicon rods or uh, nichrome or canthal rods like silicon carbide nichrome or canthal rods will be there and they will be heated now when that is heated the heat is being uh, prop, uh, transferred to the ceramic by radiation convection or conduction mechanisms fine and uh, what do you call this is what is the basic heating procedure in a conventional sintering as i told you even in your uh, regular uh, age old uh, oven in your uh, kitchen you will see the same thing you will see to uh, uh, if you go for a not a microwave oven but a regular oven wherein uh, this thing is being cooked a cake is being baked you will have heating rods on top and bottom mostly in most places then obviously you will have a tray wherein you keep your uh, uh, baking tray fine a slot for the bake baking tray so these two rods will be heated up accordingly according to the baking uh, process you can go with one or two or something whatever whatever is your programming similarly these conventional furnaces also have a programming system you can go for a certain rate of heat you can actually uh, go for a temperature and keep it keep your ceramic at that particular temperature for a longer time or you can even uh, also uh, administer the rate of cooling fine so these are all the factors uh, which these conventional sintering furnaces come with these are all the things they come with so you can actually play with those uh, inputs like what is your heating rate what time of uh, what duration of time you want to keep it at a particular temperature and then uh, to how far to what uh, high temperatures you want to take it and then come down and other things fine so that is what is a conventional sintering but here the problem is the basic heating is from an outside element outside these rods get uh, heated up and the heat is being slowly absorbed by the material which is at the center of the box fine maybe from the sides of the wall or from top and bottom of the box whatever is the arrangement but now what happens as it takes up it depends on the time and the temperature the duration you are keeping it at that particular uh, 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 that particular temperature how best the material is able to absorb that heat and what happens the outer see the outer part of the material is taking a lot of heat compared to the central part of the material is it not when you have your uh, heating rods on either side and you have your uh, material at the center then obviously the outer surfaces are taking a lot of heat whereas the central part is not taking the same amount of heat so what does that mean you have a temperature gradient is it not from center to the end of your uh, material then there is a temperature gradient there is a change in temperature with x or with your radius r uh, pellet or whatever is the this thing so there is a temperature gradient and these temperature gradients lead to thermal stresses that will lead to thermal stress in the material and would actually affect the structures the grain size and the micro size of the particles micro size and uh, microstructure of the particles or the uh, ceramic fine okay. so these are a kind of disadvantages so not only this there are a lot of other disadvantages like long time in a conventional sintering usually the program time would be of the order of 12 to 16 hours or even more at times fine if you are going for metallic alloys and all at times you need to sinter them for more than a few days few days together 10 to 15 days you need to have an uninterrupted uh, power supply and all and that is again a disadvantage and you are actually uh, using a huge amount of electricity and you are wasting energy you are, you, are, you are actually using a lot of uh, a very large amount of energy there so you can actually do the uh, uh, go for an alternate now the alternate is something like this the alternate is uh, the microwave center
So microwave sintering, as I told you, okay, we will come back to this later. Let us see, this is the setup we have uh, in our lab. And in this, what happens is you have two magnetrons, electromagnetic uh, generators. Magnetrons are the materials which generate electromagnetic waves, fine. So these electromagnetic waves, you have, this is a susceptor. And this susceptor is what is giving you this hybrid effect. After we after, this susceptor is an alumina susceptor or a, a zirconia susceptor. What we have is a zirconia susceptor. And this zirconia susceptor is being lined in inside with a uh, what they call uh, silicon carbide. You know, this blue lining is a silicon carbide, which would actually uh, keep the temperature and try to keep the uh, system at a certain temperature and keep it at an isothermal uh, region, you know, fine. And you, you have your sample here. You have your sample here, fine. Now, this is the IR uh, detector, which would actually send uh, IR radiations, infrared radiations, which directly fall on the um, sample. And that would read the temperature of the particular sample. Now, what happens here? We are not heating anything. We are not actually giving a large current to get the things heated up. We are only passing electromagnetic radiation. This silicon, uh, this mm -hmm. alumina or zirconia uh, outer layer, which is having a line, inner lining of silicon carbide, all these are very good conductors of electromagnetic waves. They conduct, and as they conduct, even all the ceramics, most of the ceramics are refractive in nature. So uh, they actually uh, take up the electromagnetic radiation. As they take up the electromagnetic radiation, what happens is the dipoles inside the material, the, the material picks up this electromagnetic radiation. You have dipoles. Now, depending on the frequency, as I told you, no, you have your AC field, wherein you have your wave, positive wave, then goes to negative wave. So in the positive wave, your dipole will be aligned in this particular direction. The moment you come to a negative wave, the same dipole shifts to the other direction. Now again, you have a positive wave, it again shifts like this. So what happens, these dipoles are oscillating at a frequency of this applied electric, uh, apply, uh, at a frequency of this uh, electromagnetic wave, which is generated in the uh, magnetons, fine. Here we have a magnetrons which generate a 2.45 gigahertz frequency. Now, what is gigahertz? It is 2450 megahertz. 2.45 is nothing but 2450 megahertz or 2.45 into 10 raised to 10 frequency, 10 raised to 10 hertz. Fine. So, this with that frequency, now you understand what is frequency or what is your hertz number of cycles per second, per one second. In one second, how many such cycles? What is a cycle? This complete wave is a cycle. One complete wave is a cycle, mm -hmm. right? One positive and one negative wave put together is a cycle. Mm -hmm. So how many such waves will be there? There will be 2.45 giga cycles mm -hmm. per second. Now you see, mm -hmm inside your material, which you have put it for cooking. This is the principally same even in uh, a regular food cooking also. Fine. In a regular bakery shop or in your own house, when you keep anything for heating in a microwave oven, you just keep it for a minute or a two, if it's a heating only. But if you're cooking, of course, you keep it for a longer time, but that's a different story. But the overall uh, mechanism is same. It's the same. The electromagnetic waves actually go through the material, whatever you're keeping at the center. Now, as they go through all these molecules of the material, they all take up. They, they, there is a one or the other in your food. You have water, you have oil, you have vegetable, you have grains. All of that is having a certain dipole, is having electrons. It will oscillate. If not, there is an electron always. So these electrons oscillate along with the field, applied, electri applied uh, electromagnetic uh, waves. 
Now, as they oscillate, what happens? What is the frequency I told you? It's 2,500 megahertz or it's 2.45 into 10 raised to 10. 10 raised to 10 is a very huge number, you know? So at that speed per second, it's at, at that frequency, it's oscillating per second. So there will be a lot of friction. There will be a lot of friction in this. And due to this friction of the dipoles, which are moving up and down, or which are oscillating with the field and trying to uh, uh, orient them in the direction of the field, there will be a lot of friction between them. And this friction would generate heat. And the generated heat because of this is the one which is utilized to cook this or to actually center the material. So you're not sending heat from outside. The heat is generated inside the material at each and every point of the material. There is no core generation of heat there inside. At every single point, at every single occupancy of the electron or the dipole or the particle, the heat is being generated. So there is a very uniform generation of heat takes place and the material gets sintered uniformly and at a very, very, very short interval of time. At a very, very short interval of time of, of the order of few minutes, you know, 30 minutes would be uh, enough for a one gram uh, pellet to be sintered. If you know the perfect temperature it, it needs, you know. And further, the other advantages of this is you have a you can you need to have only a lesser temperature. You need not see if you are conventionally you are centering a ferrite at around 1200 or 1250 degrees centigrade. Using a microwave, you can actually center it at a very low temperature of around 900. That would do. Microwave can actually center it at 900 itself because from internally the heat is being generated and. For the, to reach that 900 point from the room temperature, it actually needs some 15 minutes or depending on the rate of uh, heating rate, what you give. So once you reach the required temperature, obviously the final sintering, the soaking time, the num uh, amount of time you need to keep is a maximum of 20 minutes would actually do for most of the ceramics. Fine. Whereas in a conventional sintering, uh, if it's a 1250 is your final sintering temperature, usually the pellets are kept at that temperature, that uh, ferrites are kept at 1250 degrees centigrade for a minimum of two hours to a maximum of six hours, depending on the material characteristics you are taking. So minimum two hours is definitely required. And that is called as soaking time. That is called as soaking time. It's something like making your idli, you know. Once the steam is generated, you will immediately don't switch off it. You keep your dough in the uh, steam for an amount of 15 to 20 minutes for all your idlis to be soft and coming out nicely, you know. And uh, Tamil Nadu is very uh, famous for these idli breakfast, no? So the same thing happens here. You need to actually want to have a better uh, ceramic out. You need to keep it at a higher temperature for a certain amount of time so that it is uniformly cooked from all the sides and you get a proper grain structure, grain size, your uh, actual uh, crystal structures, uniformity in the grains, you know, the grain structure, all these things, the densities, you get a higher density here. And there are many more advantages. You can see here the heat is generated internally. Oscillations of atomic dipoles is uh, would actually generate the the friction would generate the heat uh, within inside and there will be rapid heating uh, rates when compared to 16 hours or 12 16 hours to uh, 18 hours or few days of heating this is only happening in half an hour mm -hmm. in half an hour you know half an hour to 40 minutes is a very short interval of time it's the time of your regular class you know as a regular class so. It doesn't actually need uh, much time and it will not obviously use more electrical energy also. You are also saving energy. You are saving your time. You are having a dense ceramic. Uh, see, the density is as close to as 98% as of the theoretical density. You can get to that. And you can even control the particle size. 
you want it to be in nano, you can actually play with your inputs of your uh, microwave centering programming and actually keep your materials to nano if they are starting starting materials or nano you can still keep them in the nano uh, scale or you want to grow them to micro scale also you can do that fine depending on your uh, what do you call uh, uh, centering programs fine so these are the advantages of microwave centering and the this is what is hybrid microwave centering The other one is spark plasma centering. Spark plasma centering is the next step ahead of uh, centering techniques. Here, the centering takes place in few minutes. It's just two to three minutes, five minutes program. It's only a five minute program. Here, what happens is a pulsed electric current is being sent. You will be having a graphite crucible, a graphite uh, cup kind of a thing in which you will be keeping your material and it will be pressurized. You need not actually go for dyeing, like we do the dyeing process in the other two categories. You need to dye your material into a pellet shape before you keep it in the furnace. But here, no need. You can directly put your powders because there will be a high pressure which will be uh, compacting the powders within in this graphite mold, okay? So in the graphite mode, and this uh, is, there will be a high pressure simultaneously given, and you know uh, there won't be much heat, but because of pressure, because of pressure and high electric pulse which is being passed through this, this this pulse is really really very very large. You can see here it's eight hundred amperes. It's eight hundred amperes is a very large current, and to keep the jowl heating there you will be using a DC power supply of approximately 1300 amperes. That is a very huge amount of electric current, uh, you know, but though it's a, for a very short interval of time, but it's really a very large uh, high voltage current, you know, it's a very, very high current, fine. And in a very short interval of time, quickly you can actually uh, densify your, uh, crystallize your materials, fine and you'll get very good high density uh, samples. And uh, they are very close to uh, the theoretical densities, almost 99% of the theoretical density can be uh, obtained. But the major disadvantage here is there can be carbon contamination because these are graphite, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, crucibles. It's not from the graphite actually, it's from the uh, rest of the coils you are using for these pulses and DC uh, currents, you know, because of the, such a high uh, current passing through them, they get, uh, you know, burnt, they get burnt, the coil gets burnt, and those burnt ashes may actually uh, contaminate your powders, fine, and then it's highly, highly pressed. It's in crows, it's in crows, fine. Whereas the regular furnace is conventional as well as microwave furnace comes for few lakhs. Whereas this is above a crore, okay? It's more than a crore, uh, this thing, fine. Now, coming to various synthesis techniques. So do I have time? Mahalakshmi, can will you please? I think my uh, talk was for, uh, and, and I believe I have actually crossed that limit. If that, I just wind up the talk with few. Uh, Interesting uh, materials we have developed in our lab. So is it okay if I just take another 10 minutes? Okay. Session? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mahalakshmi. Thank you. So I'll skip these synthesis techniques. These can be learned anytime and are available abundantly. And you can see that uh, these are the various techniques we use in our lab, like 
uh, solid state reaction, which is the powder using, and this is a molten salt method. Again, you'll use powders, and here in Sol Gel, you'll go with uh, nitrates, and this is a wet chemical route. The other two are uh, powder techniques, or rather uh, solid state uh, reaction techniques. And uh, ball milling is again another, uh, the, the solid state reaction in combination with ball milling is being used. And this hydrothermal technique is also another wet root and sole gel in combination with uh, electro spinning would give a very nice uh, uh, structure for the materials. And this is the spinal structure. There are uh, spinal ferrite structures. And this is how you will get approximately seven peaks for a regular uh, spinal structures, which is a standard uh, thing for uh, spinels. And you can see that when you actually go for a ball milling and a solid state reaction, you see the grain structure like this. You see grains of such big grain sizes, okay? Now, this is a hexaferrite, which will have a hexagonal uh, structure like this. Fine, not get deep into that. And these hexagonal ferrites are actually being uh, done by the solid state reaction. You see the grains are very large here using ball milling and solid state reaction. Whereas by sole gel technique, it is this. And by electro spinning, spin coating or electro spinning, you see you get like fibers like this. You get these long fibers. You can see here, this is two micrometer and the fiber diameter is much, much, much less than that. It's less than one micrometer. So these are nanofibers which we can develop using uh, those spin coatings. And this is another kind of ferrite which is called garnets. Fine. And uh, this is also by ball milling here. And these are perovskites. Fine. The ferroelectric materials. And usually a perovskite, this is for PZT that is uh, lead zirconium titanate, fine. Uh, and this is the, uh, what do you call it? It's a high energy ball milling along with microwave sintering. You can see there is a uniform grain structure. I'm sorry for the dull imaging, but however, yeah. You can see that the grain size, there is a uniformity in grain size. And as you actually do from the microwaves, that's the best part. Now, how to come to your device? In order to come or make a device, what we do is we first take up our green tapes. We take the green powders that those are being make, uh, made into tapes by uh, mixing these green powders with an appropriate polymer and you will get such tapes. These tapes are being punched accordingly wherever you want a conductor to be filled in. You know, they are being punched and the conductors are being printed on that or you can fill the conductor or you can actually layer your conductor over it. There are so many techniques to actually give a conducting contact onto your ceramic tape, okay? Now they are being aligned. It's a multi-stacking. These are called uh, multi-layer uh, uh, or multi-stacking uh, inductors, uh, capacitors. It can be anything. It can be any material, any device. You can just go for multi-stacking of them. After you stack them, just laminate them. That will compress and keep it in a compact size. Fine. Then along with the conductor, you will be uh, firing it, the final sintering. You see, we have started with green material. And now we are firing it. Fine. Once you fire it, you will be getting a final product of either of these kinds, depending on the conducting uh, 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 this thing what you have given, you know, fine. And later you can go for, you have your leads coming out of the this thing. So you can pick up and go for testing of your materials. Fine. So these are few uh, basic, we started with such uh, inductors. It's a ferrite uh, stress sensor inductor, which we have done. We have also, this is a single layer uh, inductor. We have also done a multi-layer also. I could not find the image of it. And this is a tunable toroidal inductor. In the beginning, you have seen a, tourable trans a tunable transformer, but in our lab, we have developed a tunable inductor. And, and this is another setup, which is for supercapacitor uh, applications. 
uh, which is being uh, done. You can see here we have got a voltage output of approximately approximately 1.4 or 4, I believe it's 1.4 volts. This can be actually uh, developed further. Right? But here it's totally a, a polymer uh, material. This is the material. And on either side, you have a conducting point. And this is the material, which is a composite of polymer and quantum dots, carbon quantum dots. Okay. Now, wait, maybe I have here. Yeah. And this is a piezoelectric piezity, what I was showing you. A device we have developed as a stress sensor and a voltage generator. It's an electric regenerator we have developed in our lab. And the construction is something like this. You have your uh, piezoelectric material. And this and this, uh, these are the top electrode and this is the bottom electrode. And a conducting uh, wires are being given out. Fine. And yeah, then you later you can laminate it like this. Fine. Now... One second, I think I have put a I, I think I think I must be. Yeah. You can see a video here how we have done that uh, thing. Yeah. So you see here, it is the the device is there when you actually on which is being actually uh, hit uh, simultaneously with the instrument, and this is our device. Fine. And now when you come and see it here, you see the voltage. It is being given to a CMO, wherein you can see that the device is developing a certain voltage. And uh, this is being done by one of my students, Mr. Avanesh. And I'll also show you uh, another uh, video wherein we were, he was able to actually illuminate few uh, LEDs. You can So you can see here that on every hit on the device, as it hits the device, there is a voltage generated. And using that voltage, we were also able to uh, glow lamps, lights, uh, small LEDs. Now the objective uh, remaining is how to actually store this into a, uh, this thing, make it into a storage or a regenerated device, you know, completely. This is the first level or the first part of the uh, this thing we have achieved. And this is my group. You know, this is your ma'am there, your HRD. And these are other uh, students. These four have actually completed from me. And these are the ongoing students with me. Fine. Thank you. And I'm very sorry for taking up more of your time. Students, yeah, please. Are all ferrites or semiconductor? Yes, most of them are semiconductors. Which ferrites can also be synthesized with high resistance so that they can be made completely insulators also. Okay, so it depends on the ingredient uh, materials. Okay, which type yes. of sintering is more effective? I would say microwave sintering because it's cost effective, energy efficient, you'll get uniform grain structures, uniform densities, uh, very good densities, I should say, uh, and very good high yield, understand? So uh, when you see all these things and cost effective also, you know, when compared to your spark plasma, though it gives you uh, denser than microwave, it's hardly very little. Uh, 
uh, one or two percent denser than uh, microwaves, but uh, the cost is initial cost and maintenance cost is very, very high. It, it is non comparable. It's not at all comparable with microwaves. So I would go with microwave. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your valuable understanding, ma'am. So shall I stop sharing? So thank you, thank you for your patient listening. It's over to you. I am muting myself. Now I invite Mr. T. Avanish Babu from Vellur Institute of Technology to start the presentation. Good morning, ma'am. Good, good morning, sir. Now you are the host and you may start your presentation, sir. Ma'am, screen, screen sharing is not working. Can you please make a presenter? Now you may Ma'am, is it visible? Yes, yes. Good morning to Manana. Myself, I am Avanish Babu. Doing PhD, doing my research under the supervision of Dr. Martin, Associate Professor, Center for Functional Materials, Velour Institute of Technology, Velour. Today, I am discussing about the development of microwave center PJT. PJT means lead zirconium titanate at lower temperatures and characterization. Before going to discuss about my topic, I would like to introduce my campus. This is the world map. Um, Mark, this is the university, VIT university. This is the technology tower, TT. 
I am working in ceramic composite laboratory. This is also this lab is also in fifth floor. These are all the center facilities in our VIT campus, Velour Center for Functional Materials. There are these are all the research facilities, and these are all the inside VIT boards and footways. This is our VIT campus. Before this is our outline introduction. I am doing my research in material science. For that, I am preparing the materials first. Then only I will go to the applications. The material is the most most important for any application. For that, I am most in, interesting on materials. I would like to brief explanation on materials. Uh, depending upon the application, we have to choose the materials in a different synthesis techniques in a different ways. For example, if you can take the silicon dioxide, <clears throat> there is n number of forms is there for amorphous and crystalline materials for the silicon dioxide if you take the normal glass this is the form of the silicon dioxide there is no crystallinity but it is a transplant the applications is different but if you consider the crystalline ceramic uh, that crystalline silicon dioxide uh, with the help of you can prepare the single crystal with the help of single crystal methods like bridgman technique other techniques we can made a single crystal the applications of the part is different for that depending upon the application we have to select the sintering technique and synthesizing methods today i am focusing on the ferroelectric materials especially in piezoelectric that is the type of uh, piezoelectric material why i am choosing the piezoelectric material means now the entire world will be depends on energy the energy neither be creates nor be destroyed it will be changes one form to another form now the entire world will be focused on the fossil fuels it will be create some problems like some carbon related gases carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide are releasing for that it is causing of the global warming but we are going this is the right time to avoid the fossil fuels we can choose the other alternatives like uh, eco friendly uh, energy harvesting uh, energy harvesting like solar energy or wind energy hydro energy or piezoelectric energy so many uh, energy harvesting is there but i am focusing on the piezoelectric energy because the piezo uh, piezoelectric is more convenient than others what's the reason is the solar energy it will convert the uh, solar energy to the electrical energy but it needs some batteries Yes. the battery is also creating some pollutions in environments that is some defects in solar energy or wind energy or hydro energy but if you take the uh, piezoelectric energy you don't want any uh, batteries directly it will convert to the mechanical energy to the electrical energy and the mechanical energy is abundant in nature for that i am focusing on the piezoelectric energy for that i am focusing on the ferroelectric materials how to uh, synthesize the materials uh, in the next slide i can tell you and what is the characterization in the material research characterization is the most important step without characterization we cannot do anything later only we can finalize whether the material is pure or not we are getting the pure phase or not then we can with the help of the characterization we can conclude that and the dielectric properties these are also the these are all the properties these are also one of the characterization technique with the help of this technique we can find the dielectric properties of the material especially i am doing pzt i am doing the dielectric properties for pzt and finally summary basically these materials are classified are metals polymers ceramics and composites the composites is different metals polymers and uh, ceramics are different metals are uh, having high density compared to polymers and ceramics and the polymers having very very low density compared to metals and ceramics the ceramics having in between the density between metals and polymers metals having very high melting uh, medium to high melting point and polymers having very very low melting point compared to metals and ceramics the ceramics having the high melting point compared to metals and polymers 
the elastic modulus of the ceramics is very very high compared to the polymers and metals the polymers having the low elastic modules and metals having the medium to high elastic modules metals are reactive polymers are very very reactive and ceramics are non reactive once you can prepare the ceramic material it won't react to other materials that is the main advantages in the ceramics for that purpose most of the people are using the ceramic material ceramics are brittle in nature and polymers are the ductile and brittle and metals are ductile in nature composites composites means you can mix the two or three materials like metal matrix and polymer matrix you can mix it you can simply call it as the composite and as you as a similar way you can mix with polymers and ceramics that is also a composite the properties of the composites is continuously different you cannot predict at proper way depending upon the matrix ratio continuously the properties of the composites will change the upcoming trend is the composites maybe this is the classification of the materials the outer circles will be represent as the materials individual materials like metal ceramics and polymers materials the inner circle will be represent as the composite ferroelectric materials basically ferroelectric materials are the dielectric materials these are the electrical insulators and electrical insulators it have a high dielectric constant at low frequencies these ferroelectric materials are basically divided in two types piezoelectric materials and pyroelectric materials piezoelectric materials means if you give the any external pressure to that material automatically it will convert it to the electrical energy there is some inner mechanism is there if you give the atomic if you give the mechanical pressure to the material inside the atom position of the atoms will change due to that the polarization of the material will changes according to that polarization we can get the voltage of that particular material material wise the polarization will be different uh, changes um, and these piezoelectric materials reverse is also possible if you give the electrical energy to that particular piezoelectric material it will gives the mechanical vibrations and pyroelectric materials these pyroelectric materials means if you give the temperature if you give the temperature means cooling or heating to that particular uh, pyroelectric material it will generate some voltage it is called as a pyroelectric voltage in that particular time if you give the temperature to the material the atomic positions will change due to that position of the atoms the polarization of the material will change due to that polarization you can get the voltage this is the minor mechanism of the pyroelectric effect this is the ferroelectric uh, ferroelectric materials uh, graphical representation the outer circle will be represents as a dielectric materials all the dielectric materials are the ferroelectric materials but all the all the dielectric materials are not a ferroelectric materials but all the ferroelectric materials are the dielectric materials all the piezoelectric materials are the dielectric materials but all the dielectric materials are not a piezoelectric materials this is the uh, representation of the uh, ferroelectric materials my material is the pzt lead zirconium titanate but the most of the people are focusing on the lead free materials means why they are focusing on the lead free materials means lead is the toxic and it will give some environmental pollutions before going to explain that i would like to tell the what is the d33 and dielectric constant and the transition temperature here in this picture the left side y axis is the d33 d33 means it is a type of piezoelectric coefficient it is the it is also one of the one type of characterization once if you give the pressure to the material how much piezoelectric coefficient is there it will be represents that is the called as d33 and the right side y axis will be represents as dielectric constant if you give the energy to that particular uh, material how much energy will be stored 
in that particular material it will tell it simply we can call it as the dielectric normally these ceramic materials are the dielectric materials if you give any energy to that particular material it will store this y axis will be represent as the dielectric constant and the x axis will be represent as a transition temperature the entire picture will use the clear image of the ferroelectric materials what is the fer transition temperature of the materials and what is the dielectric temperature the d33 coefficients of the uh, lead and lead free based materials and what is the dielectric constant of the lead and lead free based materials uh, this picture it will give the some idea this blue uh, batio3 is the lead free material this is a type of lead lead free material the dielectric constant and the d33 is very less compared to the lead based materials the transition temperature before going to discuss about that i will give a brief explanation about the transition temperature in the transition temperature means if you if you take the ice cubes if you can give some heat of that ice cubes it will melt it will change us to solids to liquid it will change the uh, one form to another form like it will transform one form to another form the atomic position will be changed in that particular ice and that liquid uh, if you melt it it will convert to the liquid all of the properties of the material will be changes that is the transition here we can take it as the transition temperature if you give the temperature to the particular ferroelectric material before transition temperature this is the batio3 based uh, electric materials the transition temperature is nearly 120 to 125 degrees centigrade before that it will act as perfectly ferroelectric material after 125 to 1 uh, 130 it will act as the para uh, para electric material it won't have any distortion crystal structure if any distortion crystal structure is there means that time it will give some electrical energy it will give the perfect ferroelectric properties otherwise it it can't give the perfect ferroelectric materials the batio3 based materials having very very less transition temperatures compared to other materials these bismuth sodium titanates have less d33 and less dielectric constant but the transition temperature is in between the lead based and lead free based materials the sodium niobates sodium potassium niobates having a uh, little bit d33 is better and the transition temperature is very very high compared to all the materials depending upon the applications they will choose which type of material is suitable for that particular applications but normally lead based materials plays a major role in the device prospective due to this high dielectric constant high d33 and high transition temperature this for that purpose i am also choosing the lead zirconium titanate but my in my synthesis technique we are avoiding the voltageization of the lead that is the novelty in my work this is the normal ceramic processing first of all we are taking the stoichiometric ratios of the powders like the zirconium uh, dioxide titanium dioxide or lead nitrate we are taking the uh, taking as the initial materials later we can grind it for reducing the particle size the property of the materials will be depends on the particle size if your particle size will be increases that time your properties of the materials will different if you particle once the particle size will decrease means that time the properties of the materials will be changes depending upon the particle size all the properties will vary for that we are using some grinding some mechanical ball milling high energy ball milling later after grinding we are going to some heat treatment simply call it as the calcination after calcination we can simply call it as a green body after green body again we are going to grind it for the reducing the particle size then we can go to the final sintering heat treatment called as the final sintering finally we can get the final product i will give some differences between the some sintering techniques about the conventional and micro sintering techniques 
uh, how the microwave sintering will work, how the lead volatility will be decreasing. In, we are avoiding the lead volatility in the microwave sintering. I will explain. Normally, this conventional sintering follows the joule heating, but microwave sintering it is following the rapid internal heating. Conventional sintering having uh, it requires the high sintering temperatures and longer sintering times, uh, sintering dwell times compared to the microwave sintering, because microwave sintering have very uh, directly this electromagnetic radiation interact with the uh, ceramic samples. Inside all the dipoles will be oscillating. It will generate some heat. Due to that heat, it will sinter. It requires very less amount of sintering temperature and less dwell time. For that purpose, all the ceramic materials are sintered at low temperatures. Due to this particular point, the voltageization of the red lead we are avoiding in microwave sintering. For that purpose. We are concentrating on microwave sintering, and all the properties like D33 and uh, dielectric properties and other properties will be enhanced with the help of the microwave sintering. The density, the high densification will be improved in microwave sintering compared to the conventional sintering. What is the reason? Is this conventional sintering the heat will be dissipated from outside to inner sample? It will take some time. There is no uniform sintering. Some porous uh, porosity will be high uh, the, in conventional sintering materials due to the conventional sintering materials are not, uh, it won't give the much dense compared to the microwave sintering. Due to that, all the properties in the ceramic sample, all the properties will be depends on density. If your sample density will be more, that time all the properties will enhance. And the microwave sintering gives the good microstructures and it is very economic compared to the conventional sintering. Conventional sintering is the higher energy con consumption and it is costly compared to the microwave sintering. These are all the applications of the ferroelectric materials. These ferroelectric materials are different types of materials is there. Pyroelectric materials, piezoelectric materials and ferroelectric materials. These pyroelectric materials are per per perfectly suitable for the sensor applications like uh, uh, temperature sensors. These piezoelectric materials are perfectly suitable for the energy harvesting applications and yeah, as well as <coughs> sensors, pressure sensor, touch sensors, etc. And these ferroelectric materials are usually uh, applicable in the uh, data storaging. For that, they are using in the RAMs. These are all some biomedical applications of the PZT. This PZT, the inside is the PZT material. This material having the crystal structure, tetragonal crystal structure. These PZT materials are basically using in ultrasound imaging applications and hearing aids, ultrasonic therapy, DNA hybridization. These are all the biomedical applications of the PZT materials. This is the temperature profile of the XRT patterns, basically. I am fired the samples in microwave at different different sintering temperatures. I am started at 800 to 900 with a time interval of 20 degrees centigrade. Usually, this 80 degrees centigrade temperature, there is a star and a ash mark. I am representing. <clears throat> These are all the impurities, or it is called as not, not a reacted in unreacted elements. For every, I am increasing the temperature for every 20 degrees ten interval of time <coughs> temperature, the impurity phases like the unreacted elements will be reacting properly. Finally, 900 degrees centigrade temperature, we are getting the pure phase, perfect tetragonal crystal structure of the PZT material. This is the dielectric profile with varying temperatures of the PZT. Normally, the 800 degree centigrade temperature, the dielectric constant is in, in between 600, 1600 to 1800. Compared to others, it is very, very low because the unreacted zirconium oxide is more in that particular 800 degree samples. If we increasing the, gradually we are increasing very every 20 degree centigrade temperature, the dielectric constant of PJT is increasing. Finally, 
900 degree centigrade temperature having high dielectric constant compared to others and it will maintain standard transition temperature compared to others this is the dielectric profile with variation of frequencies at high frequencies almost all the dielectric constant of the all the temperatures are closer at low temperatures the dielectric constant is vary because at low frequencies it it will vary easily but higher frequencies the polarization will vary some little bit different difficult for that here it will give the clear picture of the dielectric constant versus frequency this is the last tangent basically the last tangent will place the key role in the ceramics your dielectric constant is high as usually your last tangent is also high means it is not applicable for the device fabrication point of view once your uh, ferroelectric material have a very less dielectric cons uh, very less losses means that is perfectly suitable for the uh, device point of view because the losses is very very less compared to uh, other this this pjt material have very less dielectric loss compared to other ceramics for that it is perfectly suitable for the device point of view in like uh, any other field like electronic devices or biomedical applications everywhere it will be perfectly suitable for the uh, industry applications these are all the last tangents with the varying of frequencies here the inside 400 405 410 these are all the temperature variations uh this particularly uh, if go to the last figure pjt 900 uh, 430 is the transition temperature nearly the the losses is nearly very very less in that particular transition temperature region this transition temperature plays the key role in the ferroelectric materials not only ferroelectric materials every material transition temperature is most important these are all the conclusions the pj electric materials are successfully synthesized in energy ball milling i am focusing in energy uh, ball milling so many wet roots is also there but it won't give the good yield for that i am choosing the ball milling this x ray diffraction confirms the tetragonal pure phase and the uh, crystallite size is nearly 30 to 60 60 nanometers this xrd will confirm that uh, finally the present pjt ceramic materials are uh, applicable for the real time applications thank you thank you ma'am thank you for giving this opportunity Thank you, sir. You have explained very clearly. Next section will be attacked. Two o'clock. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Let's wind up the session. I request the participants to join at two p.m. ओके okay.